In the name of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Your Grace, very Reverend the Reverend Fathers, as you all know, tonight's topic is wisely using the gifts of God. Um, the foundation for tonight's topic is going to be the well-known gospel about the talents, which is in Matthew chapter 25, verses, verses 14 to 30. So what we're going to do, we're going to analyze this, that gospel to define what the gifts are, to name them, to learn how to properly use them, how to wisely use them, and then to see what are the consequences of not using wisely the gifts of God and what are the consequences of using wisely the gifts of God. So as an introduction, we'll uh, actually remind ourselves that God created humankind in His own image and likeness. And one of the first commandments given to humans immediately after the act of creation, as seen in the Bible, was, Then the God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, and so on. So explaining this verse, St. Basil the Great underlines that when God said grows, it applies actually to spiritual growth in God. Unlike animal beings, human beings have been invited to spiritually grow above their, their own created nature and not to be enslaved by it. So for us, the meaning and purpose of life is not, simply, is not just to simply survive in this world. So man is the only being created, entrusted by God with enormous potential, manifesting the possibility of endless spiritual growth. And that likeness I just mentioned in which we are created is the potential to become like God. So every human being is invited to fulfill this, but this is only possible in communion with God. And this potential is what makes the deification of humans absolutely possible. <clears throat> so, as I said, although God creates all living beings, only humans are invited to attain perfection according to God. And this is what Christ says. Therefore, you shall be perfect just as your Father in heaven is perfect. So, the question is how to actually achieve this. And Christ answers this question for us. Through different Bible stories, Christ shows that every man not only possesses potential to be like God, but also receives from God various gifts that enables him to fulfill that potential. So the well-known Bible story about talents, as I said, is the foundation for tonight's talk. This gospel explains that eternity is offered to and accessible by every man without exception. Now we'll slowly explain and actually see what's happening in this gospel. This is how it begins. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his own goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, and to another two, and to another one, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately, immediately he went on a journey. In the time of Christ, so I'll explain this verse first. In the time of Christ, the reason of having servants was so that the master could enjoy a pleasant life, a life of luxury. Servants did not possess anything, nor receive any gifts from their masters. They were fully dependent on their masters. In all their jobs, they were monitored constantly and without any freedom. Christ uses the relationship of servants and masters to remind a man of his dependency on God. Because God is the, the one who gave him life and the world to manage. At the same time, Jesus wishes to show that God is far more generous with man than any man master to another man servant. In this world, from the perspective of the relationship of the servants and master, only the master benefits while the servants are exploited. When we view the relationship between man and God, only humans can benefit because God does not depend on man and any action by man do not affect God's existence. So the man who travels to a far country is actually Christ, the God-man who speaks this parable just before his ascension. The servants of God are people who all receive different gifts from God, without exception, and live in this world waiting for his return. 
To express how much God gives to men, Christ uses currency that was in circulation in those times, the talent. And back then, the daily wage was just one silver coin. And one talent was worth approximately 6,000 silver coins. So to earn one talent, a man needed to work approximately 6,000 days or 16 years. So from this story we see that even uh, the servant who received only one talent was undoubtedly entrusted with great wealth by his master. So talent, metaphorically, depicts not only the size of God's gifts, but also the, the totality of all good things given to man by God. So the gifts God gives to man can be varied. I divided them into three groups. The first group are actually material talents. These are wealth, favorable living conditions, social status, and good health. Group number two, these are the talents of the soul. Lucid mind, good memory, various abilities in the arts and crafts, the gift of eloquence, courage, sensitivity, compassion, and many other qualities that are placed in us by the Creator. And the group number three are actually the talents of the Spirit, and the Apostle Paul enumerates some of them in the first epistle to the Corinthians. I'll just quote Apostle Paul. This is what he says. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given by the Spirit of the world, by the Spirit the word of wisdom, to another the word of knowledge by the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another the gift of the healing by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kind of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. So diversity of gifts does not mean that God loves someone more and someone less, but reminds us that we are all different and unique. These are, there are not two Christians, actually, that are identical. At the same time, diversity of gifts indicates the need to supplement each other or to help and assist each other because there is no one person that possesses all gifts. Now it's actually important to talk about something which is the main problem when we talk about gifts because most of the people tend to believe that because they worked hard and sacrificed much to attain certain skills that this entitles them to be selfish. This is a very common misconception about God's gifts. Even if we have not been born with some skills but earned them through hard work and many sacrifices over the years through school and in life, these gained talents are still gifts from God. We are still invited to share them with those around us and especially with those people who are in need. The Apostle Paul continues, Corinthians, just con continuing f further, and confirms that all gifts are given by one and the same God, comparing all people with the limbs of one body that complement each other and make it whole. So he speaks here about the community of the faithful, pe faithful people, the church. And only the church, as the body of Christ, has all the gifts. This is what he says. But to one and the same Spirit works all these things. Distributi distributing to each one individually as he wills. For as the body is one and has many members, but all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. So the purpose of spiritual gifts is the growth of the whole church. When we read the first, actually, verse of this gospel, it's written that the gifts are given to each according to to his own ability. That means that God, as our Creator, knows what is the best for each and every one of us, and according to our abilities, we are given such gifts. And then it's written, and immediately he went on a journey. So these words speak of the degree of freedom that man enjoys in his relationship with God. In other words, the eternity offered to man is not imposed, imposed, but only offered. Humans are left to choose if they wish to work on it. 
we're going to see from this parable a bit further that one of these three servants used his freedom in a negative way and refused to work on multiplying the gifts he received. <clears throat> and then the next verse from this gospel. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more also. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid his Lord's money. So, the explanation. Using the parable of our talents, servants and masters, the whole story, Christ displays two groups of people who use their gifts in different ways. Those who align their life's interests with, with God's interest in this world and strive to multiply their gifts through, through hard work belong to the first group. These are servants who received five and two talents and multiplied them through work. They accepted God's call to accomplish themselves as eternal beings. Through their eyes, this temporary life is seen only as an opportunity to gain eternal life. And now we come to, very, to the very important question, how do we apply this to the, modern, to the life of a modern, modern Christian? So, this is how. Using Christ as the role model of our lives, every man should place him, himself in a balanced relationship with God, other people, and also with the world in which he lives. This is achieved by wisely using the gifts given to us by God. So whether man lives in wealth or is struggling for mere survival, regardless of one's social status or anything else, the entrusted gifts should be used to worship God, to help other people, and to save the world entrusted to us. The multiplication of, of these received talents represent the spiritual, spiritual growth of these two first servants to the higher level, and I now I quote Apostle Paul, he says, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, Ephesians 4.13. Of course, it is clear that these gifts are certain abilities and that each skill increases with practice. However, the received gifts should not be used only for the sake of our selfish indulgence or for our survival in this world. world sorry. So the various gifts are not given for personal benefit only, but also for the benefit of those close to us. <clears throat> and of course, if we neglect our neighbor, the people that are around us, and only exploit our gifts for our personal benefit, then we are identical to the third servant who buried his talent in the ground. Now we're going to talk, talk about the third servant. So the third servant represents the second group of people who use their gifts received only for the sake of this earthly life. <clears throat> this is the reason why the third servant is, is portrayed as the one who buried his talent in the ground. This all takes place because man alone cannot see himself as a being that is intended for eternity. Therefore, is, if he accepts this temporary life as the only reality, then the meaning and purpose of his existence are in the struggle for achieving a long and more comfortable earthly life. <clears throat> Without God in his life, a man declares himself as the most perfect being and thus becomes an idol to himself. <clears throat> that always leads to egocentricity and selfishness as man neglects the people around him and becomes devoted exclusively to himself, leading to all the gifts from God being used for the sake of ensuring one's own material safety and the fulfillment of the urges of human nature. This is how every human being can unconsciously become a slave to his created nature. Basically, the third servant did not take advantage of the potential of eternity bestowed in him by God. <clears throat> now, the gospel continues. <clears throat> This is what he says. A long, after a long time, the Lord of these servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I have gained five more talents besides them. And his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Also he who had received two talents came and said, Lord, you delivered, me, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents besides them. 
And his Lord, his Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You are faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of your Lord. Now, the explanation. So, the settling of accounts, as it is written here, by God with man is actually, is actually judgment day. In this gospel, this moment is simply described as a settling of accounts. In some other gospel, it's clearly called the judgment day. So nowadays, the mentioning of the terrible day of judgment is incorrectly associated with a ruthless God who tortures humans. While the, on the outside it looks like the judgment of God over man, it is essentially the judgment of man over himself. The prefix terrible actually expresses the terrible mistake man makes by choosing this temporal and mortal world over eternity. So the truth is that at the moment of setting accounts, man receives what he worked toward, toward, towards and for in this world and this life. If we have sowed and scattered seeds in this mortal and dec decaying world, we will reap and gather mortality and decay. So the Apostle Paul clearly describes the following. This is what he says, Galatians chapter 6. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows in the, to the flesh, of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit, will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. So analyzing these verses, we can see the consequences of wisely using the gifts of God. So the first thing we see is that the servants who multiplied their talents were, were called by God good and faithful. This is interesting because when Jesus was called good by, by the people, he said, Why do you call me good? No one is good but one, and that is God. Matthew chapter 19. Then how can a man be called good? He can but only when he rises above his human nature, which is enslaved by bodily instincts. In practice, that implies that a man accepts this world as, a something, tempor as something temporary, and himself as a creature that is, that is intended for eternity. So although we live and work in this world, this life should be seen only as an opportunity to attain eternal life through Christ. So if we allow, Christ, allow Christ to enter into our hearts and our souls, then we will begin to think and act as Christ. Then the virtues of Christ will become our modus operandi, the way of our functioning in this world and the measure of every aspect of our lives. By practicing Christian virtues, there will be no place in our hearts for self-love, anger, hatred, unforgiveness, greed, vengefulness, and many other destructive passions that are so typical of the human nature. And the highest that man can achieve is to feel what the Apostle Paul experienced. And he says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer who I who live, but Christ lives in me. And at the same time, those who have multiplied their gifts are called faithful. So faith is not only knowledge about God or simply rational experience that God exists. Faith is complete trust in God and complete reliance on Him, and that implies that man strives to fulfill and accept all of God's advice. We learn this from the third servant, actually. So he's aware that he is aware of the existence of his master, but he's not called faithful because he did not use his talent wisely. The same analogy can be applied to a man who's aware that God exists, but do not know, but do not do what God commands him. And then, the verse that says, you were faithful over a few things, I will make you ruler over many things. So these words indicate that no matter how fascinated we are with this life and the world we live in, it is still minuscule compared to the eternal life and the kingdom of heaven. <clears throat> Christ underlines this when he says, now I quote, so for what profit is it to a man if he gains the entire world and loses his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? Matthew chapter 16. So regardless of all that man possesses in this world, he still needs to multi multiply God's gifts. And the gospel story of the poor widow confirms this. Luke chapter 21. Her two mites 
that she donated were more precious to God than that which the rich man gave because she enclosed her gift with love, not from excess. So we should not grieve and regret that we are not rich or envy, envy those who have more than we do. Even the one who lives in poverty can be made ruler over many things, as Christ says, if he tries to work on his spiritual growth. Then the words, enter into the joy of your Lord, are words that describe the final and complete union of man with God. So no matter how hard we try, even the greatest of the ascetics could not achieve complete union with God in this world. Complete union between man and God will only happen in the kingdom of God that will be preceded by the second coming of Christ and the judgment day, or as it actually mentioned here in this gospel, settling of accounts. So to enter into the joy on your, of your Lord is something that a man cannot get from earthly rulers and masters. This expresses the mystery of deification and mystery of sonship. These words are also the confirmation of God's righteousness. As a servant who received two and the servant who received five talents ultimately received the same reward from God. Then the next verse is this. Then he who had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man, reaping where you have not sown, and gather where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and went and hid your talent in the ground. Look, there you have what is yours. So, Christ, this is, this is interesting, because Christ dedicates most of his sermon to the dialogue between the servant who does not use the talent wisely and the master. We clearly see that those who work and those who do not work will both have to settle their accounts with God. So the prize is rewarded not for saving, but for the increasing of the talents. So the servant calls the Lord a hard man who was reaping where he has not sown and who gathers where he has not scattered seed. This is perfectly normal for a man who sees himself as the measure of everything. In reality, this third servant, he is actually the hard man who reaps where he has not sown and gathers where he has not scattered seed, not his master. This is a classic projection of his weaknesses upon his master. The fact that he's using that is an, this, is, this as an excuse shows that he knows that what he's doing is actually, is actually wrong. Due to his doing what is wrong consciously, the master calls him evil. Rather not to repent, he tries to justify himself by blaming his master for everything. And the way he addresses his master depicts a man who justifies himself in, every, himself in every situation and always blames others for his mistakes. The root of self-justification lies in pride, one of the most destructive sins for a man's soul. Pride prevents a man from admitting that he's wrong and that his heart should open up for repentance. Without repentance, spiritual progress is impossible. And this is one of the main differences between Christian and non-believers. A faithful Christian has been instructed by God how to recognize and to deal with his sins. Recognizing sins, a Christian uses repentance to cleanse himself and accept Christ as a perfect role model to correct himself and to redirect his life towards deification. So the third servant, instead of seeing himself as he truly is, he attributes all his flows to God. His laziness is exposed in the fact that he, was, he will not work on himself. This is proof of how important it is that a man keeps his soul clean. And even when we immerse our soul in sin, we can cleanse it through repentance. His inability to see his master as he truly is, is the consequence, consequence of his spiritual impurity. His heart, his soul, his body, his complete being is, in, is immersed in self-love, so that his mind cannot see anything other than self-loathing in other people, even in his master. And, and Apostle Paul explains this. He says this, To the pure, all things are pure, but to those who are defiled and unbelieving, nothing, nothing is pure. But even their mind and conscience are defiled. So here, the third servant depicts those people who do not want to participate in the suffering of Christ, but instead want to be fully part of this world. 
They desperately want to belong to the majority, regardless of what the majority stands for. They cannot rely on Christ's words because they are in conflict with the popular opinion that the majority creates. Christ's words are hard for them to grasp and to accept because he asks for love, patience, restraint, forgiveness, meekness, righteousness, and many other virtues that he brings into this world. For them, this world is the only reality, while God is someone who burdens people with difficult rules and imposes a virtuous lifestyle that prevents bodily pleasures. They do not want to be rejected and despised by this world. Instead, they want to be loved and acknowledged by this world at all costs. They believe it is not fair that God gives them anything that obliges them to return later on. The closing words to the master, because he says to his master, look, there you have what is yours, points to the rejection of God's gifts as something unwanted. For them, God is too strict because he restricts their freedom. The perfect God would be the one that pleases them and, and fulfills all of their desires. And this is the reason that the third servant says that he was afraid, trying to blame God for his laziness. And saying these words, he believes he should not be punished because it is not his fault that he has not multiplied the received gifts. He actually tries to say that it is, it is, his, master's, it is his master that should change, not him. It is now clear that the received gifts were immediately buried. So he never intended to use these gifts for the purpose of his spiritual progress. And since the Lord has been absent for a long time, the question is, what has this servant been doing, all, been doing all this time? And the answer is clear. He has dealt with his own selfish interest in this world. He has not brought his life into harmony in accordance with those of God. He has dedicated his entire life to his own selfish needs without regard to anyone else. This is why he speaks to his master in such a manner where he considers that the master is, a self, is selfish as he is. But now the master replies to the servant. But his Lord answered and said to him, You wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown, and gather where I have not scattered seed. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. And at my coming, I will have received back my own with the interest. Here, what do we notice here? We notice actually that the master is not attempting to defend himself. He calls his servant evil and lazy. We already mentioned that the master calls him lazy because he did, he did not work on the spiritual development of himself, of himself and evil because he consciously did what was wrong. However, there is another very important reason why the master calls him evil. A self-righteous man thinks that the entire world, including people, and in the end God himself exists to serve him. Everything that a self-centered man does is only for his own benefit. If there is no personal gain, he does not want to participate. Because of such a view of the world, such people find it hard to develop a relationship with God. When it comes to their relationship with God, at best, they believe they can live in a, in a neutral zone. And we often hear this, especially when people come for confessions. You know how they confess? They always say, I did not kill anyone, I did not steal, and that's about it. While at the same time, they reject the chance to follow Christ as the role model in their lives. But to be complete Christian, we should abstain from evil, but we should also not abstain from doing good for any reason. This is what the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 12. I'm whole what is evil, cling to what is good. So these two things go together. So not doing good in Christianity is equal to doing evil. It seems illogical, but in the absence of good, evil slowly becomes stronger and takes over. And that is why Christ requires us to be active, not to become tiresome in doing good deeds, because he was relentless when it came to the salvation of every man. And the gospel describes what Christ did, how he struggled every day to help men who was in trouble. He was healing the sick, resurrecting the dead, feeding both their bodies and souls, preaching to them, comforting them, and many other things. So if Christ is our, mo if Christ is our role model, then we should be 
excited to do good, not only to abstain from, from evil. And then, not using our gifts to do good to all, unconsciously, we actually help evil progress in this world. Now, the words of Christ. So you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers. So he indicates what a third servant should have, should have done. It is clear that various gifts are portrayed through the silver money of the time, the talents. And it is clear that one single man cannot possess all the gifts. By using the word bankers, the master suggests that one can still find the gifts secure in one place, that is, in the church as a community of faithful people. So what does this practically mean for Christians today? So the bankers represent the other faithful people to whom the third servants could have turned to learn how to use his talents wisely. Also, as worshipping Christians, we are regularly exposed to endless examples of people who already use their talent, talents, their gifts wisely, and have entered into the joy of the Lord. And these are actually the saints. No matter how many gifts we have, if we are part of the body of Christ, we will use our gifts to the benefit, for the benefit of the whole community of faithful, the church. This is how we can certainly multiply those gifts. For example, by participating on the liturgy, we put many of our gifts to use. Thanksgiving, prayer, charity, humility, and many others. It, and it is also very important to clarify the following words. This is what Christ says in this gospel. At my coming, I would receive my own with the interest. Obviously, the words at my, com at my coming refer to Christ's second coming and the day of judgment. Since we know that God created everything, visible and invisible, it is clear that all of creation is his own anyway. Of, of all that is created, only humans have inbuilt pot potential for spiritual growth. So my own are humans, and the interest is man's earned eternity. Only those who accept the calling and multiply talents through their work and efforts are those who have fulfilled their potential and thus earned the interest. The only profit a man can earn by using gifts from God is actually eternal life and nothing else. And that is a man who uses God's gifts wisely and fulfills his potential to become like God. This earned eternity is the gain that the Lord will accept on the day when he comes to settle accounts with us. As all of deified creation is returned to God at the day of judgment. This is the way in which the master takes what is his own with the interest. And now we're going to see what's going to happen to the third servant who rejected eternity and didn't use God's gifts for his spiritual development. So the following words of Christ will explain that. So take, the, this is what Christ says, so take the talent from him and give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has, more will be given, and he will have abundance. And for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. The fact that God takes from one and gives to other proves that he does not keep anything for himself. Our Lord is the master who gives back all that has been earned to his servants. If we earn eternity in this world, we get to keep it. What may be confusing at first glance are the following words. But for him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. How can you take something from someone who has nothing? For God, the only valuable, thi valuable thing a man should possess is the eternal life that this, this servant has not attained. This is what he does not have. But he still has the, the talent that was entrusted to him. The ta this talent is taken from him and given to the one who has multiplied his gifts. So possession of certain talents does not mean that someone will inevitably, inevitably gain eternity. We see people who have incredible talents every day, but they do not use them for their spiritual development and advancement. These words explain that the one who is rich spiritually in this life will be spiritually richer, richer in eternal life. At the same time, he who decides not to work on himself from within in this life will lose that, we, that which was received in the beginning. So in the end, the evil and lazy servant was thrown in the, into the outer darkness or a place where he was separated from God. <clears throat> 
And now the Christ says, And cast the unprofitable servant into the outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. <clears throat> I'll tell you at first glance, this looks like punishment. In reality, this is not the vengeance of God. It is crucially important to remind ourselves that the kingdom of heaven is actually communion with God who is a person. He's not a faceless force that floats in the universe and on which we are to attach. In order for one person to be in communion with some other person, what is necessary is mutual love, trust, and obedience. Those who prove obedient and faithful to God and have complete confidence in Him will enter into eternity with Him. The first two servants prove this through the multiplication of the God's given talents. And even in this world, without love and trust, the communion of two persons cannot survive alone. It is, it is thus unrealistic to expect that someone will be rewarded for the things he does not want and for what he deliberately refused to do. So every man that chooses corruption and, had consciously, and consciously ignores the potential of eternity will actually receive corruption. God will not impose eternity upon those who, don't, who do not choose eternity in this life as that would be a form of abuse by God to impose eternity over the freedom that man has been given. And now, as a conclusion, just to recap everything. So, there is, no, there is not a single man to whom God has not given a talent and invited him to use them to become like God. So not a single excuse will justify a man for not using God's gifts when the moment of settling accounts arrives. Spiritual laziness cannot be justified neither by poverty, nor lack of education, nor social status, or any other life situation that can take place. The moment we start using our gifts, they will begin to multiply. And as Christians, we should be as active as Christ himself. Christ has shown us through his own example of how we should use the gifts received from God. Through the course of time spent against, amongst the people, the God-man Jesus used not only to fulfill his Father's will, but also to serve others. The beginning of man's part to deification is to realize that the meaning of his life is in, in the eternity that God offers him. Man must first accept himself as a being that is intended for eternity, not for this perishable and mortal world. By accepting eternity instead of transience, man quickly learns that this can only be achieved in communion with God. So the mortality of human nature cannot provide man with immortality. From this moment onwards, it is much easier for man to recognize God's gifts as tools for continuous spiritual improvement of himself. As an imperfect being, which is in invited to improve, man, man will have falls and trials and tribulations on the road. Through daily life experience, man will also meet, man will also, man will also meet the dark side of his human nature that will drag him through the deceptive impulses towards this world. However, as one of the greatest gifts to God, God gives the possibility to repent, through which every man can always return to, one, to the one path that will lead him to eternity. An excellent example of this from the Gospel in the story of the prodigal son who takes his talents that are portrayed as his inheritance after which he separated himself from his father. So taking his share of the inheritance while his father was still alive shows that his father does not exist for him at this moment. The prodigal son represents a man who disregards God completely and only uses God's gifts for his selfish pursuits. After his repentance, sonship is restored, and through the festive dinner that represents the Eucharist, he is again welcomed back to be a part of the community of the faithful people, the Church. A Christian should work primarily on himself and strive to change from within. This is never an easy task and requires much effort, persistence, and the constant crucifixion of our free will, of our mind, and of our soul until, until we can completely submit to Christ. Whoever tries to live like Christ will be rejected and despised by this world as Christ himself was. Therefore, the life of a Christian compares to one's particip participation in the suffering of Christ. So those who do not give up 
uh, do not surrender in the face of temptation, will, as Christ says, enter into the joy of their Lord. Or as the Apostle Peter says, they will feel joy in the revelation of His glory. This is what he says, I quote the Apostle Peter, but rejoice to the extent that you partake of Christ's sufferings, that when His glory is revealed, you may also be glad with exceeding joy. We are required to rise above this world, reject our, ourselves as an intelligent animal, guided only by bodily impulses, and to turn to God as the only source of true life. And this is possible if we wisely use the God's gifts. And this is what Apostle Paul says. Having the gifts, deferring according to the grace that is given to us, let us use them. If prophecy, let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Or ministry, let us use it in our ministering. He who teaches in teaching, he who exhorts in exhortation, he who gives with liberality, he who leads in diligence, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So we have gifts of God and we are invited to use them. And thus the rule is very simple. So everything we do, whatever gift we use, is it to be for Christ and in Christ, carefully guided by the following words of our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, Assuredly I say to you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these my brethren, you did it to me. So let us see every day of our lives as an opportunity to get closer to the Lord by doing what He was doing. Celebrating our Heavenly Father in the liturgy, helping people in need, and taking care of the world that God entrusted us. So this is the only true way to fulfill God's commandment, to become fruitful and to enter into the joy of our Lord. Amen. So that's the... Um, that's from me tonight. So if you have any questions, you can ask now. Lodica's here. The other priests are here. So we'll try our best. It, we'll try our best to answer. This is a beautiful topic. Very uh, deep. Of course, there are plenty, gifts, plenty of gifts of God that could have been described here. I just mentioned a few of them. I know it might be a bit too long. I don't know for how long this uh, lasted. But I printed this in these tiny booklets, and I'll give, give them to you when we finish this. You don't have to memorize anything. I said it's all, it's all here. <laughs> Pleasure. So any questions? Thank you.